So, Chris, I know ah, we're we're back. We're back. Um, all right, everyone. This is my pal, uh, Chris Graham. He's the founder of Tell People. He is based in Toronto. Uh, we met. Uh, we met because of I think it was a LinkedIn post first. Yes, it was in my book review of this book, The Roadmap to All of Your Dreams Coming True. It's right. It's right. I love it. What someone actually? I because I. I commented on a LinkedIn post for one of the Bright Network students and I put my BYDN and he put it as BMDN, build my dream network. And I'm like, you go, buddy. You got this. You got this. Uh, so I want to talk to you about, I mean, last time we were talking about the book, but this time conversation, I want to talk to you about your career. Uh, okay. So you were a lawyer. What, what made you go into law? Uh, it's a great question. So I, the short answer is I was trying to, at the time, find the hardest thing I could do with my life. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, intellectually challenging. It turned out to be emotionally very difficult, but I, I wasn't like trying to find, I wasn't like a masochist trying to find this emotional challenge. So at the time I went to a business school, a small business school here in Canada, and I won't say which one, but it, um, it wasn't, uh, it, it ended up, didn't end up being very challenging. And so the opportunities coming out of that that were directly related to business didn't feel to me very stimulating. And so I was thinking, well, what, I want to do more school, uh, but I don't really want to do more business school. So what should I do? And because my dad is a lawyer, I had this example of somebody who was like a very serious lawyer and it, his job seemed very hard and the problems that he worked on were very complicated. And so I thought, oh, I'll do this. Basically, that was what was happening. Got it. Yeah, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Well, yeah, because that's, I mean, that's one of the things about being a lawyer is that it, and legal studies, it is intellectually interesting and challenging. And that does in some ways make it kind of like, oh, what do I want to do if I want to apply my law degree to something else? How do I find and surround myself with driven, intellectually stimulating, all that kind of stuff? So you came and practiced in New York, but what kind of, what kind of law did you go into initially? Talk, talk to folks about your, your career. Right. So I initially, I came to New York City and I ended up practicing bank regulatory law. And I know looking in the news, it probably doesn't seem like there's any regulation of banks in the United States of America. There's a lot of regulation. It's a very complicated system. And so my job was to sort all that stuff out. So, you know, if I'm a bank, can I merge with another bank? Or if I want to borrow a certain kind of money, can I do that? If I want to, uh, this sort of thing. So that's what I did when I was in New York City. I did it for about two years. And it was from 2007 to 2009. Okay, so how did you, yeah, how'd you get into that? Bank oh. regulatory. Why, why bank regulatory? They don't, there wasn't a choice. It's kind of like going into the army. They're just like, we need people on this, uh, at this part of the line. So you go there. To be fair, uh, that was the most prestigious part of the practice at the firm I was at. So I was happy to go there. It's kind of like being like a Navy SEAL uh, in, in, uh, in the U.S., also, though, in 2008, there was a massive financial crisis in New York City and in America. And of course, it sprayed around the world. So it was a very interesting time to be a bank regulatory attorney. I didn't I wasn't hoping for a crisis when I got there. But I guess in retrospect, it was the most interesting place to be at the time. Interesting. Yeah, because I hadn't um, when I was practicing in Toronto, I had not studied banking and insolvency law. And once I got staffed on one of those deals, I, I, I mean, I absolutely loved it, which I think, you know, there's somewhat, there's a lesson in that. Sometimes you just got to write, there's a need here. Let me run towards it because, you know, I'm going to learn how to do a lot of skills that I could then, you know, move, pivot over to what I, the other things I want to do. Yeah. And actually on this point, <clears throat> um, you know, especially coming from Canada and then going to work in the U S I definitely didn't study American bank regulation at law school. The point is, it doesn't matter. The whole point of law school is to learn how to like think like a lawyer, basically how to find the answers to problems. But you can then do anything in the firm. They don't care. Nobody was interested in, except with the exception of tax. They were like, you could have study tax if you want to practice tax. But otherwise, I could have done anything. White collar investigations, insurance, regular, all the business things. Um, so whatever's happening in law school has very little relationship to what you want to study or what you want to do if you go into practice with the possible exception of tax. Yeah. No, but then also, too, you went back to Canada and practiced something completely different after that. That's true. After I left banking law, I actually went to England and I went to school in England, which is interesting because I guess this system is a U uh, UK based program. Um, but then I eventually came back to Canada and I practiced Aboriginal law 
which is the law of, in America, you would call them Indians uh, or indigenous people in other places, which again, is totally unrelated to anything that I studied in law school or certainly when I practiced on Wall Street. Um, but ultimately, you know, contracts are contracts, similar kinds of problems. And so I was able to take the experience and the uh, practice tips or the practice skills that I learned practicing in New York and easily apply them uh, with appropriate modifications in a totally unrelated field in Toronto. And what attracted you to do Aboriginal law? Oh, man, I feel like most people have really good answers to these questions. <laughs> but, but maybe it's helpful for people to hear my very pragmatic responses. So. The answer is I needed a job, is the answer. So when I came back from New York City, I wanted to be a writer. So I spent two years writing a novel and trying to freelance. It was all very romantic and not very profitable at all. And at the end of this period of time, I needed to work. And so a friend of mine who had worked in New York City at the same firm as me had come back to Toronto and become a partner at this Aboriginal rights boutique. And he saw me needing a job and he's like, well, you're smart, come work at the firm with us. I'm sure you can figure it out which was of course true, um, but it was, yeah, I had absolutely no like burning. It wasn't something that I sought out. It was because somebody in my network knew that I was valuable and that I needed this, I needed this work or there was an opportunity there and we were able to make it happen. Um, but that's probably not what you thought I was gonna say. No, but that's really great. I'm like, it's sort of like the value of building those relationships with your colleagues at firms. I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, the experience you had being a, a new attorney at a time of sort of economic crisis, my own career in law starting off at a time of economic crisis, you could either have the daggers out for your colleagues or you can build relationships with them, realizing that that is sort of longer and more important than the short term, you know, kind of economic uncertainty and chaos and pain that we're in right now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, in the time, I, I'm sure that maybe there was something similar for you, but like in New York, when I was there in 2007, 2008, my classmates were getting fired um, it, from their firms, which if you're a foreign person in the U.S., that means you have to leave the U.S. And yeah. so like there was a huge amount of support. A lot of it was moral support, emotional support, but like trying to help people out when they got back to Canada. I mean, we were all very much in it together because especially in a financial crisis, it's a lottery. It could have easily been me. It wasn't because I was somehow better at being a lawyer than anybody. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh no, I remember because I was um, manager of alumni programs at a global firm then. So I I remember those times well, my friend. I remember them well. Um, let's talk about you know I want to talk about what you're doing now, how and how you've used your law degree to create like the 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 not that I want to encourage people to leave the law. It's a great career, but it's the fact that, you know, you may need to use it in different ways right now to ultimately steer yourself in towards the path, the career. So tell people what tell people is. <laughs> so tell people is a consulting firm that I started. Uh, we teach storytelling and communication to professionals, uh, which essentially or a good example of this is helping lawyers talk about their work to their clients. Uh, <laughs> if you spend any time with lawyers. This is a challenging thing for them to do. Um, but also other professionals. So we basically work on this problem. Right. Uh, how I use my law degree, this is an interesting question. Um, I guess there are a couple of things that I would say about this. One, getting back to what I said before, I wanted to go to law school because it was the hardest thing I could do at the time. One use that I make of my law degree is it reminds me that I can do things that are hard. So starting a business is very challenging, not for any technical reason. It's mostly just emotionally and intellectually. You got to like get over the fear of taking the risk. And if you can get through law school, you can figure out how to start a business for sure. Um, so this is something that I use my, this is a non-traditional use of the law degree, but a very real one. Uh, it's a very valuable use. Yeah. I guess, you know, they're the sort of like typical things you say about like, I have an analytic way of thinking, pretty good at problem solving. And I guess this is true. I'm able to break down a very uh, sort of chaotic situation into something more manageable. But you can learn this in lots of different places. Um, I guess the other big thing, though, and we've talked about this before, is my law degree is valuable because of all the people I met trying to get a law degree. Um, virtually, I can't remember what I said the last time, so don't hold me if this number isn't the same, but I think 90% of our revenue in the first year, two years, was from people I had been to law school, with, either directly hiring us at their firm or indirectly introducing me to somebody uh, at a different firm or a different sector. And it's still, you know, I don't know what the law firm alumni revenue is now, but like most of our revenue period comes from 
people I went to school with or people those people have introduced me to. So this, again, was probably the most valuable part of the experience. Yeah, I say we, with the, those networks, those relationships, those people we've gone through the trenches with. Um, I always sort of find it so funny when people say to me, when do you, when do you get rid of a network? And I'm like, never. <laughs> You know, if you're getting rid of yours, I'll take it. <laughs> Have it on over, but you, you never know with some, you like, just because you're not doing bank regulatory work in New York anymore, doesn't mean that those relationships aren't just value and for the reason of, well, who knows? Maybe there's something at some other point in time, or maybe you'll know someone who needs a bank regulatory lawyer or, or you know, like who knows? Who knows? And on this point, like, um, so one of the strange things about being a bank regulatory attorney in New York City is like, that's a very difficult job. But in Canada, like five people care. It's kind of like winning the bronze medal at the Olympics. No one thinks we've won a bronze medal. But so the only reason I was able to get this job at the Aboriginal firm is because a person I used to work with and so who knew I was valuable and smart worked at the place. None of the other lawyers at his office cared that I worked on Wall Street, right? And all else equal, that's not a valid, that's not a relevant um, data when you're trying to work in Aboriginal law. But this person who I knew, part of my network, was able to vouch for me and say, he'll figure it out, he has the skills. There's no way if it's not a person from my network doing that interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so keep, keep those people close. You know what, you have a great example on one of your um, presentations that you were, and I remember watching this online and you, we're kind of taught, and because I think it's sort of like a great career tip for people. Um, and the idea of when you walked into a partner's office as an associate, and you were like overloading this person with information. Um, can t- talk about like, you know, because I think that's one of those things right now. We're so eager to impress that we're missing the communication and the social cues and thinking about, right, what's the right information to present to someone, whether that's in an informational interview, if you were granted one, or a real interview, or you've got an internship, or you're a trainee, or you know an articling student, and you walk in and you've got you know some partner behind a whole stack of stuff. You know what's give, give some give some context. I, I've given the sort of lay in the land, but you go talk talk. What's your advice? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just making notes while you're talking. That's what that's what happened. Um, yeah. So I think I love. I guess I want to pick on what you said. I love the way you described the challenge, which is I go into an office. I have all these things to say, and I want to give the right information. And I think that's how a lot of people think about it. And I want to suggest that that's the wrong way to think about it, especially if you're a junior person, like you're an intern or. Uh, a first, a young associate, let's say, or you're uh, even in a job interview, how are you ever going to know what the right information is to give? Especially if you're talking to a person with 10 years experience, that's the wrong way to think about that interaction. What you want to do is be a thoughtful person. So you want to say the thoughtful thing, which is something like, I know a lot about this situation. I think what you need to know is this, but that might not be true. So let me know. Right. So you want to say you just want to think about what's going to be relevant to the person I'm talking to. What's the one thing or the second thing? And then say that to them. But in a way that lets them know that, like, what I'm trying to do here is make a guess about what's going to be useful for you. But like, this is a conversation. So like, if that's not the right thing, let me know and I can give this other thing. Um, trying to if you think about it as sort of like a one shot deal, like a speech, it's very hard to get that right. Um, and thankfully, you know, when you're in an interview or in a meeting with a partner, it's not a speech. Those are conversations and conversations are where you say something, they respond, you respond, et cetera, et cetera. Um, everybody is capable of doing this. Nobody expects you to speak in sort of fully formed sentences or just divine the right information that they need. Um, that's their job. They've been there for a long time. That's not your job. Yeah, yeah. that's such great advice. Cause I think, like I said, I think we're, because things are so uncertain, I think we are feeling very um, anxious and I'm gonna say I'm gonna say some way small and like the littlest thing of something mm-hmm. not going right can knock us off our sort of confidence game. Um, and because the stakes are so high because we don't know if people are gonna hire in the same numbers and all the rest of it. But this point of having that Think of these things as a conversation and a dialogue 
and in some ways we're sort of reciting back to the person oh now you've asked me that and i'm thinking this way is that what you know love that that's a really nice i hope everybody's writing that down that's a good way to think <laughs> but but in all seriousness especially if we're talking about job interviews in particular because i coach a lot of students informally like mentor them on job interviews people are always asking me like what's the best thing to say if I want to work in litigation? Or what's the best thing if I want to work at this firm? Or how can I talk about this partner's practice or something? And what I always say is what people are looking for in a job interview is for you to be a thoughtful person. That's what people are looking for because you have no idea if you're going to like working in a, at a firm that you've never been to at all. And they know this. So nobody expects you to be a professional lawyer when you're doing the job interviews. What they can work with forever is a person who demonstrates thought, reflection, patience, who doesn't panic when they don't know the answer. Because being a lawyer is mostly not knowing the answer. If your clients knew the answer, they wouldn't call you. <laughs> that's the only time, that's the reason they call. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I wanna say, and, and I always sort of think of it, and this is why I think where we're kindred spirits and partly you know, how we've connected is like, you know, what is the thought you can put in before you walk in the room, you know, mm -hmm. like what's this partner like? Well, you know, go and do some snooping around the internet or what's this person like? You know, like what are the things you could find out? What does um, a firm or an individual making some sort of accolade or acknowledgement? Um, I've always laughed, you know, when you see partners who've been practicing mm -hmm. for, you know, 30, 40 years and they still have law review on their like bio. I'm like, really? That was like Bruce Springsteen glory days. Like, get over it. Like, have you done anything in the last 30 or 40 years? Yeah, so don't lead with that last rhetorical question. <laughs> I know this is a serious topic. We do have to have that like little little bit of advice. What what advice would you give to you? You know, if you were if you were Chris Graham was applying for like you go back in time. What what advice would you give to that Chris? Like upon reflection of everything you've done in the interim, all people you've mentored and coached, and the the presentations you've given at firms. What's the advice you'd give to that Chris? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I want to preface my advice by saying it's easy to give this advice. It is very hard to take this advice. So I just want to acknowledge I'm in the cheap seats here now. The advice that I would give is that the stakes are not nearly as high as they seem. It is going to be fine. If you can get into law school, finish law school, you'll be fine no matter what happens in your life. You don't get hired back for your job, you'll find another job. Five years later, you'll be flourishing. Um, it's the, everything feels sort of like life and death is overstating it, but it feels extremely serious and consequential in the moment, trying to decide where to apply to law school, where to summer, do an internship, whether to take a job, et cetera. It's fine. It is, you have no ability to predict the future and that unpredictable future will arrive and you'll still be fine. Um, so as if it's at all possible to be just even 1% less stressed about whatever decision you're trying to make in uncertainty, I will feel good about this advice. Um, but again, easy to say, hard to live. And I that's very true and I respect you feeling anxious and that's okay too. Yeah. That's that's such 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 good advice. I'm gonna take that advice too. Um, any other, res I know you've already held up my book. You are so awesome. Uh, other, other resources, um, recommendations on things that people can, should read, watch, subscribe to. Interesting. Well, I'll subscribe to BYDN, obviously. If this is on YouTube, I'm sure there's a subscribe button in the bottom. Um, no, this is going to be in the community. This is for them. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, once you're finished this, go on to YouTube and subscribe anyway. Um, I guess, no, in all seriousness, one book that is for sure useful is a book called Difficult Conversations. Uh, mm. It's my favorite book. It's by, if you've ever heard of the Harvard Negotiation Project or the book Getting to Yes, which is maybe the most famous book about negotiation. Those same people wrote a book about difficult conversations. And the basic premise is, and if you're negotiating with somebody, there's all this theory about how to get the best outcome. And that's how to, that's getting to yes. But even if you know all the theory, at the end of the day, there's still another person that you're negotiating with. And so difficult conversations is how to deal with the human side of negotiations and conversations with people. It is hands down, 
the second most valuable book that I've ever owned. Um, but it is equally underlined compared to this one. How about that? Let's let's say that. That's that. Difficult conversations. Excellent, 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 excellent. Um, and I would say any other, I would say websites or things that you refer to regularly yourself. That's interesting. Websites that I, well, actually, if we're on websites, one thing I would I would never look at is websites like The Vault or um, above, above the Law or any of the other ranking websites. They do good work and it's very fine, but it will freak you out. All of this and all of the message boards about where people are getting hired, stay far away from this until you have a job and then you can go and look. Um, well, that's interesting for me. I have such a tar I read four newspapers a day. So I would say The Guardian, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal and The Globe and Mail, which is a national paper in Canada. I spend most of my time like soaking in information through those sources. But I don't know if that's. That's awesome. But no, it's, it's just interesting to know what, what media people consume. That's and, and what, what is yeah. their kind of thing that they go to to keep themselves informed and, you know, getting ideas. Uh, and I think, you know, something like reading traditional media right now, particularly business pages, as we both know, you know, some industries are dying and others are thriving um, mm -hmm. right now and opportunities are going to come because you see those patterns, which is where our crazy, critical thinking, lawyer, problem solving brains kick in. This is very true. And actually, if we're talking about like sources of culture and information, that's a good question. Um, I also read The New Yorker, The Atlantic, M Plus One, which is a literary magazine, and another literary magazine called The Point. And these are uh, weekly, monthly, monthly, monthly. Uh, the trends that Kelly's talking about, I completely agree. Well, I just referred to you in like the second person and we're having a conversation. Um, <laughs> Cause we're friends and we can do that. I'm still not quite in the virtual space. Um, but no, the, Kelly's totally right. Reading the, like the Wall Street Journal, especially the, there's trends all over the place there. And uh, especially if you're interviewing for uh, business type jobs, this is a good resource to read. But for like interesting perspectives on this kind of stuff and it's sort of like social consequences, reading not the business pages is yeah. critical because that not to knock the business pages are doing their job but it's a very it's a particular job and yeah to the extent you're whole, ultimately if you're a lawyer or you're anything else a consultant business working in not-for-profits you're working with people and people are not reducible to numbers and trend lines and so if you're reading at least one kind of culture magazine you have your what you're doing is getting the language for how to talk and think about people yeah 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 any, any other final, no, because there's never a final word, because I'll think of something else that I need to talk to you about, because I seem to have a habit of doing that. You're going to rule the day that you ever posted that book review, because you're like, God, no, just wanted to tell people it was a good book, and now this woman won't leave me alone. Um, any other parting words of, of career advice to you know students right now? Uh, I mean, uh, good luck. It's okay. Um, and I guess, and this isn't a plug, it really is like, Think about, think from your network out as opposed to like job listings in, I would say this is, that's something I did not do when I was looking for a job. Uh, things were a bit different back then, but um, it is overwhelming. The chances of being successful are overwhelmingly greater if you start from people you know and build towards some sort of opportunity than just like applying to like online databases and things like this. And I will approve of that statement. Thank you, as always. And uh, we'll talk again soon, I hope. And I want to hear more about other things that you're up to, like speaking at NELP, my my old my old professional organization. So make a cameo. Come for a victory lap. <laughs> Who doesn't love the Mandarin Oriental in DC? Like, come on. Oh. <laughs> Praying that you get there, buddy. Praying that you get there. Oh, everything is crossed. <laughs> exactly. Fingers, toes, eyes, everything. All right. Thank you for that career advice. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kelly. Chat soon. See you.